Um, my name is Anne Niemann. I'm an architect from Munich and a researcher at the Technical University of Munich. Um, and like many other speakers before me, I guess, I am very concerned about the state of our world and I'm looking for the sustainable solutions for the building sector. Um, you all know these images, the floods in Germany, the forest fires in Greece and other parts of the world. That was really shocking this year. And this was only in 20, uh, 2021. So it's clear that we have to act and those of us employed in the construction sector have a big part to play in that. You probably also know this chart. The built environment is responsible for 35% of energy consumption and 38% of CO2 uh, emissions. And these figures are from 2019. Um, so probably it's much higher now, I guess. Furthermore, the building sector is responsible for 12% of the global water consumption and even 40% of the global waste. And sometimes it's hard to grasp, but the Earth's uh, resources are indeed limited. So, for example, the cement consumption of China in uh, 2013 to 2016 was as high as um, the cement consumption in the whole USA from 19 to 2000 in 100 years. So we have to change something. And I want to present you today two strategies or two projects um, which could contribute to a new building culture. Um, the first is the Simple Building Research Project. It has to do with um, wood, but not only. And the second is about building with hardwood. So I start with the uh, Building Simply Research Project and the background of it. First of all, the requirements re relating to the fire safety, the thermal and sound insulation of buildings have been rising for decades. So the increased use of technical equipment and improvements to building materials um, will help us achieving the high, high goals. I mean, do we really need those goals? But first of all, of course, to save energy in form of heat energy and ensure building users can enjoy year round comfort. Um, but it all gets very complicated. And um, we have a, a multitude of regulations of technical rules, and that's often too much for building designers and owners. And the consequences of this are mistakes in planning, design, construction, and even operation. And so we did ask the question, how could it be made simpler? So how can walls, ceilings and windows be designed and arranged so as to be um, particularly advantage in counteracting the cooling of rooms in winter and the overheating in summer? And uh, what role do people and the climate play in this? Um, so our team, uh, we are architects and engineers from the field of construction and environmental. Um, we thought about answers to, to, we thought about answering the question of how architecture itself could be optimi optimized um, only by constructural means, so that it requires the least possible technology to create a pleasant indoor climate. Um, and something else we looked into was how these simply built buildings would perform compared to both standard and low energy residential buildings. And this with respect to, respect to the effects on the environment on the one hand and their life cycle costs um, over a period of observation of 100 years. That's quite unusual. Usually you look into 50 years in the future and we really wanted to, um, to know what happens in this 100 years. And it, is it worth, um, building a house maybe a bit more um, more cost effective, but is it worth doing that looking in the future? So the starting point for our investigation was to simplify the construction. We wanted to get rid of everything which was not necessary. <clears throat> so in the beginning, we did a research about um, the highly developed construction materials like solid wood, as you can see here, um, the lightweight concrete and uh, highly heat insulating masonry. 
as low layer or monolithic wall structure. And that was important to use uh, materials which we normally use for residential buildings. Um, and on the basis of these findings, uh, we were able to design individual rooms and investigate the energy consumption. So in the middle, we had the base case. That was our standard room with 18 square meters. And then um, we changed the, the parameters. For example, we changed the material. So we had um, the massive timber, masonry, or con concrete. Uh, we changed the geometry, the room height, the proportion, um, or the size of the window. And uh, of course, everything is linked together. When the, wind, the, the wall gets thicker, the window gets a little bit smaller. Um, And, um, and then it was important that the room gets still light. So it's, uh, of course, it was um, a room without a window doesn't need very much um, energy, but that's not uh, the point of it. So we, um, the daylight factor uh, determines that it doesn't get too dark in the room. It has to be a, a, at a minimum of 2%. And what you see now are two different rooms. The left one obviously is too dark. The daylight factor is at um, 0.53%. Uh, the other one is very bright, wonderful, but it will probably overheat in summer. The daylight factor here is at 10, uh, around 11%. So we ended up with more than 2000 different room variants. So we had uh, 81 geometries, then the four compass points, uh, three constructions, three types of glazing. So in total, almost 3000 variants, but um, some of them were too, were too dark. So we ended up with this 2600 variants and my poor colleague had to simulate and evaluate it. Um, but in the end, um, it was found out that room variants with a reduced proportion of envelopes so that, that means with um, a very little outer facade, with a good thermal storage masses and uh, optimized windows areas with a daylight ratio of 2%, that means rather small windows, they proved to be optimal with regard to low heating in winter and reduced overheating in summer. So this too had to be achieved. And in the end, that's, that's a bit like traditional housing, like the old houses we know um, where people maybe couldn't afford big windows, but that all makes sense. We've just forgotten about it. So in the next step, those successful rooms were investigated for their robustness. And that means um, what happens when the boundary condition uh, are changing, for example, the climate or the user behavior. Because usually the aim of a planning process is to find the optimum solution for the task. For example, a low rise house achieves the best possible values in terms of heating requirements. Um, however, there's often no consideration uh, of the fact that the environmental parameters assumed to be ideal can change dramatically in reality. So we took this assumption as the basis for the robustness analysis. Um, and then we compared it with um, a standard a room model and standard construction and low energy construction. So we had the masonry, the infralight concrete and the solid wood and those other two, and then had a, a variant number of 128. So that was still okay for my colleague to simulate. Um, you will look at the changing boundary conditions. What, uh, what is different? It is in German, I'm sorry, but I will translate. The first one means uh, there are just more people at home. That's what really happened here in, um, in the pandemic. People had to stay at home. And does it get too hot then in the end? Or the second one, uh, what happens um, if the climate changes? Also, that is happening at the time. It gets warmer and warmer. Then we have a user who either um, um, doesn't open the window at all, or he's opening it, it all the time. 
Um, and the last one is when the sunshade isn't working. <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, in the next phase, the results were added to schematic buildings. So we just uh, took those room and like glued it together uh, to some very uh, schematic buildings, one with uh, three stories, four and, and uh, six. Um, and using full scale models of the facades in solid timber, masonry and concrete, we tested those monolithic constructions uh, in, and incorporated simple functional details. Then we determined the costs for construction and operation, as well as the environmental impact. And here, um, this shows the um, uh, global warming potential, the environmental impact. Um, part of, of it is in German, but you can read it on the right side, the blue on the bottom is the um, uh, global warming potential for the production. So it shows that um, if we look at it over 100 years, the, op the operation clearly dominates the production in all variants. Um, but uh, still the three built simply variants on the left, Leichtbetonholz, Mauerberg, were roughly comparable to the standard and low energy houses. So we are the, the timber construction obviously is a bit better, but the others are yeah, comparable. But then um, the user comes in and this is only the ventilation behavior. So if uh, we look at it over a period of 100 years, the user can really um, blast out all the energy out of the window. And that means uh, that we have to build our buildings really robust. Um, otherwise, uh, we will lose too much energy. And here, the robust um, buildings are a bit better. So taken overall, the results confirm the initial proposed hypothesis. Simple residential buildings with high quality architecture, fit for the purpose, robust construction and reduced building technical services are superior to both standard and low energy residential buildings with respect to the effects on the environment and the costs, which I didn't show, but that's about the same. Mm, and simple buildings means designing a building to be a robust and durable through a series of decisions from the very start of its planning. And that's important because we can decide so much at the beginning. So we did this research and then we had the opportunity um, to implement our simple building strategy in three research houses in Bad Eibling. And they were built in solid wood, um, masonry and lightweight concrete. They have three stories, um, no basement, and in a total 23 apartments. And the goal was um, that they are robust and they should require minimal heat energy and not overheat in summer. We have um, a single layer component made from natural, so timber or renewable materials. And so we wanted to protect the environment over the whole life cycle of the building. And the result are buildings that are simple to build and simple to operate and that people really understand those houses. Um, to implement those building strategies, we have written a, a guide, a guideline, uh, which explains which building parameters should be given more attention to and why. And I will um, show you that. But first I want to show you a little movie about the houses. I hope that works. Auf dem Parkgelände der B&O-Gruppe in Bad Aibling werden zurzeit drei Wohngebäude errichtet. Diese Forschungshäuser entstehen in Zusammenarbeit mit der Forschungsgruppe Einfach Bauen an der TU München. Die Strategie Einfach Bauen hat das Ziel, die Komplexität beim Bauen zu reduzieren. Dazu werden die Mittel der Architektur eingesetzt, um Gebäude zu entwerfen, die von sich aus wenig Heizenergie verbrauchen und sich im Sommer nicht zu stark erwärmen. Techniksysteme für Lüftung und Kühlung können dadurch entfallen. Die Außenwände der drei Forschungshäuser sind als einschalige Massivkonstruktion aus den Materialien Holz, Ziegelmauerwerk und Infraleichtbeton gebaut. 
Die Erfahrungen aus dem Bauprozess werden in einem Leitfaden zusammengefasst und der Allgemeinheit zugänglich gemacht. Für die Bewertung der Strategie Einfach Bauen werden in den Forschungshäusern der thermische Raumkomfort und der Energieverbrauch gemessen. Die Ergebnisse sollen zeigen, wie robust Gebäude sind hinsichtlich Veränderungen wie dem Wetter oder dem Nutzerverhalten. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm sorry that was in German, but I will explain it anyway. <clears throat> so we have six um, principles or six strategies. And the first one was compactness. Um, if you compare a city apartment with a tiny house, it's very clear that even when the living area is reduced to 18 square meters, the building envelope that is the roof, external walls and windows is twice as big as that of a um, um, 72 square meter apartment on the top floor of a multi-story building. And uh, I think you know that external walls and roofs are the most expensive surface forming components in a building, much more than internal walls. And reducing the building envelope saves money and is good for the environment. Um, so there are two strategies to achieve it. First one is um, reduction of the living area. If we make the living area uh, smaller or if it designed efficiently, that is uh, reduced then the required building skin is also reduced. And the other one is a compact design. Um, the areas of the external walls and roofs are reduced with uh, respect to the living area. So an urban block edge development, for example, naturally leads itself to this approach. Um, what did we do in the research houses? Um, uh, everyone, every one of these houses offers a living area of 400 square meters and the building envelope area of 870 uh, square meters. So the ratio is about one to two. It's better than the tiny house, but not as good as the apartment. But of course, if you build um, such a house, it is uh, worse than a five story residential building in town, but still we um, try to design it as compact as possible. And it's just this very um, compact and smooth structure without any balconies or anything. That's a floor plan of uh, every house. Um, yeah, one, two, three. So the, the second principle is the material appropriate design. And um, it's about, of course, about the external walls again, because they protect us from environmental influences. And at the same time, um, we use them as part of the load bearing structure. They are responsible as a facade for the appearance of the house. Um, and the requirements placed on external walls have increased in recent years, particularly with regard to insulation properties. Uh, therefore, usually they are constructed from several layers, each of which plays a different role. But looking at the building in the future, the following questions came to mind. When one or more of the layers reaches the end of its service life, how will it be replaced or repaired? Or uh, will replacement components for the building continue to be available even in the future? Or can we reduce these components? So the basic question is how sustainable is this building with many layers? So we thought um, to recommend to use a low number of component layers, to use one single type of material and assembly of components into robust and durable constructions and taking into account the properties of the material. And so the shape of the openings follow the rules of each material so we could avoid a window lintel which has steel inside and is a mixture of materials. Um, the outer wall is constructed in one layer and this um, monolithic buildings refers generally, generally to the use of a single construction material such as concrete, brick or timber, you know that already. And this term means formed from a single block or stone and comes from Greek. And here it decri describes the combination of various functions, for example, support stru uh, structure, 
and thermal insulation in one component. Um, so we have just one wall and um, it fulfills uh, all the functions of the building in one single component. This I wanted to show you just to see how we constructed the, um, the timber house. It is solid wood. Um, it's a um, cross laminated timber construction with integrated uh, isolation, uh, insulation inside. So it's really one piece, but we have an additional cladding on the outside, but not on the inside. So it's a very simple construction. Um, that's when we build it, uh, everything prefabricated. The erection is very fast. Uh, and even the details become very simple. On the left side, we have the roof. It's a simple cold saddle roof and the insulation lies just on the top of the upper ceiling. Um, we have no basement. The insulation is inside of the concrete floor plate. And all this makes it easier to maintain it and to remove it at the end of the lifespan. Uh, the third principle is thermal inertia. So we know that buildings with a high mass exhibit thermal inertia and everyone knows that places such as uh, churches or basements also remain cool in summer. Um, So if we didn't have this thermal inertia in a building, it would soon become very warm inside the room. We often have these problems with timber buildings. That's why we used um, concrete ceilings in that building. But still, um, the building can be thought of as a thermal battery that can be continually compensated for the temperature of the indoor air. So, and the, this capacity of this battery depends on the type of construction of the building. And the best is, of course, the concrete building, uh, which has a very big battery. Um, every heavyweight construction works like a large battery and a lightweight building has just a small battery. Um, but it worked with all our three buildings very well. And this is a typical week in August. We measure, measure the indoor climate. Um, the three lines are um, the outdoor temperature, the orange one, then the room temperature and the radiation temperature. Um, and you can see that uh, those red lines, they remain almost constant and that's uh, the important ones. Uh, a further link in the chain for using the thermal inertia of building components is the ability to effectively ventilate during cool summer nights. Um, so we have designed special windows um, called pivoting windows. This type um, of window pivots from the middle. And even when only slightly open, a good amount of air flows in and out the room because there's an opening at the top and at the bottom and the warm air exits through the top and cold air enters through the bottom. Um, now we talk about the windows and the openings are an important uh, part of the window. And um, we found out that they shouldn't be too big. So the glass area should uh, be about 10 to 15% of the room area. Um, otherwise, uh, the rooms would overheat. And the installation situation is important. High rooms, for example, with high set windows bring a lot of daylight into the room. And light from two or more sides creates equal brightness with balanced contrast. So there's a lot of uh, design you can do in advance to really um, provide a robust house. How did we do it in the research house? Um, as you can see, uh, in the normal rooms, we have um, the ratio of the glazed area between 12 and 16 percent and the stairwells 9 percent. Uh, so the amount of solar heat entering through the windows in summer is not very high because the windows are now, uh, not larger than necessary to provide a reasonable level, level of daylight. And as I said, they are uh, set on the internal face of the wall. And the reveals cast a shadow onto the windows. And so um, the amount of heat which comes in is reduced. 
Um, the next one is system separation. So people think of buildings as being static. In German, for example, the word for real estate is immobilie, which su just, uh, suggests immobility. In contrast, the same language word for furnishing, mobiliar, suggests mobility. Um, however, when a building is considered over a time span of 100 years, what we did, or longer, it soon becomes clear that many parts of the building go through several cycles of changes, and that we have to bear in mind to separate those different layers so we can uh, maintain it. Um, and we tried to do this in the research house. So we have the shell, which is almost everything because uh, we don't have um, much uh, layers. Then the envelope, uh, that's only the windows, a fit out and the fitments. And um, the designer should also ensure that trades follow one another on site instead of working at the same time as it's often the case and overlapping layers should be avoided wherever possible. This not only avoids problem in the sequence of construction, but also modifications can take place in the reverse order of construction. So if uh, you want to rebuild it, it's just easier. So here you can see the power line, which is just under the baseboard and can easily be removed or changed. So the last one is a robust technical system because um, about 20 percent of the whole life cycle cost of the building is incurred during the planning and construction phase and the remaining 80 percent of the costs occurs in the use phase and this is another um, uh, research project where it's shown that uh, on the left a very simple window ventilation produces much less uh, global warming potential than um, a centralized ventilation system with heat recovery. Although we think it's a good technical system, but in the end, um, if the user is not working it well, it, uh, it's not better. So in our research house, users control the fresh air inflow th just through the windows. That's very simple. They can do what they want. Um, we have um, in the bathroom, um, a little air fan uh, in the internal bathroom, but that's it. And until now it works very well. So it is possible to build buildings simply, to operate buildings simply and conserve the environment over the whole life cycle of the building all at the same time. Um, and we all know that, that those strategies are not new. On the contrary, they have been known for ages. However, using, using them in a logical combination leads to a sustainable outcome. And we just should bear in mind, sometimes uh, the simplest solution is uh, the better one. And we are very happy that building those research houses, uh, it was just a good opportunity to build up practical experience in this field. Um, at the moment, we are in phase three of the research project. And in order to understand the potential of this strategy, we carry out a number of measurements during the use phase. And if you're interested in that and the result, um, please have a look at our website, www.einfach-bauen.net. OK, that was the first research project, not only about timber, but other, I think, very important um, things. And now I will talk about building with hardwood. That's also very interesting. Um, and I will tell you why this is a vision for the building industry and what it has to do with climate change. So many people think that the use of hardwood in the construction sector is a relatively recent development. And it has only been a few years since modern hardwood products have been used in timber construction in Europe. Um, to a small but growing extent. And the knowledge about the properties and possible applications is, um, is still correspondingly small. As you probably know, the number one wood in, cons in construction is spruce, used as solid beams and boards, um, bonded to form glued laminate, laminated timber, so glue lum or CLT, or used in timber composite materials. But from a historical perspective, however, hardwood has always been a part of timber construction. 
And this practical experience has just been lost over time. So wood is one of the oldest building materials. Forests were present in most regions in the world. And in addition, wood is relatively easy to work with even with uh, simple tools. So naturally, wood from native trees was used, also due to the lack of transport routes, routes and possibilities. Um, so people used what was available in the immediate vicinity for climatic and geological reasons. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. And even Vitruvius describes how the wood species that were common at the time were to be used. That's uh, here the text. I don't read. Um, it's about oak, elm, poplar, cypress, and so on. But it's a very old text, you know, Vitruvius, and it's it's funny that uh, already he, he talked about it. So even primitive buildings show that the early builders selected the material according to the most favorable properties out of experience. Um, that's not old, <laughs> that's a museum, um, but it reminds of an excavation of a Neolithic settlement um, where 13 different types of uh, wood were used to build the huts. And the main materials were willow, alder, hazelnut. Um, they were easy to work with, very flexible, but still uh, sufficiently strength. Uh, but the most important species among the hardwood trees used for construction was oak. <clears throat> and oak was very durable and even considered indestructible, uh, even underwater. And so it's not surprising that entire cities were built on wooden piles. So you you know Venice, you know this um, picture, but also uh, other towns were built on wooden piles on oak, like um, Ravenna, for example, an Italian city. Um, and it was located on the Adriatic Sea at the time of its founding during the Roman Empire. So it was uh, at that time on the seaside. And similar to Venice, it was a lagoon city surrounded by water. So they, uh, they were driven oak piles in the ground to fortify it in the marshy subsoil. And it's funny because today, uh, due to the silting up, the city center is now nine kilometers away from the coast. And other examples, um, cities you know, Copenhagen or Amsterdam, St. Petersburg, um, they also have foundations on hardwood piles. And this chart shows, um, I marked it in yellow, the service life of uh, oak or different wood species when stored um, outdoors, unprotected, um, or even underwater. And it's amazing that oak will last uh, for up to 800 years underwater. Uh, a thousand years uh, when stored in dry conditions and even unprotected, untreated up to 120 years. That's amazing. Um, so it was also used in half timber construction. That was uh, known since ancient times um, and used in the Middle Ages until well into the 19th century. Um, and experienced carpenters knew that among the available woods, mostly fir, spruce, and oak, uh, sometimes large, the wood of the oak is the most resistant to moisture and should therefore be used for the purlins. For example, high load components were also made of oak, while softwoods were used for interior fittings, uh, for cladding, and so on. And this is a wonderful example, the Knochenhauer Amtshaus, so the Butcher's Guild Hall in Hildesheim. It was built in 1590, uh, 1529. Yeah? It's a 26-meter high building, and it illustrates the wealth of this guild at the time. <clears throat> and it survived for several centuries thanks to its solid oak construction. So you can see the step projections of the upper stories. They protect the supporting structure below from the rain. But then it was in 1945, um, and, and then it was completely destroyed by fire following a bombing raid. Uh, such a pity, um, but they historically reconstructed it um, in the 1980s, and they used 400 cube meters of oak 
um, they joined it to form 4,300 connections using 7,500 wooden nails. So at least they rebuild it. That's another example. It's a residential building in Franconia, um, built also in the 15th century. <clears throat> and it also shows the selection of um, timber variety and of its application corresponding to its properties. So oak was used for the outer frame, especially for supports and, and struts, while aspen was employed for smaller, less heavily stressed supports. And finally, spruce and fir were used for the interior construction for beams, purlins, and the entire roof st structure. So oak is um, brown red, aspen is yellow, and spruce and fir are uh, olive green in this image. So for large, large spans or in very specific, highly stressed applications, the hard oak helped early builders to realize their work. Um, even uh, on the left side in the Dome of Florence, we find oak. Uh, it is constructed of um, um, two four meter thick inner shells um, of um, masonry, but they stand on, a, on an anchor chain made of oak. Uh, to make it stable and at the same time it's elastic and it's a very small detail um, but nevertheless very important and this detail can also be found in other domes. And here on the right side um, that's a very big hall in Edinburgh built in the 13th century and the roof structure was uh, for hundreds of years considered the largest in Scotland. This is Notre Dame um, the famous church you probably all know, we, we see a drawing on the left side from the 13th century and an old engraving um, without the wooden tower that came later. And that happened in 2019, so sad that it burned down. Uh, I visited Paris this summer, they're actually talking about uh, reconstructing it. And they discuss how they could do it because it's not um, easy to find um, all beams of the length and the quality that they need. They've built wonderful models and they've already reserved 13,000 French oak trees for the reconstruction. And I'm very curious how they're gonna do it. Reuse is a very important subject. The procurement of timber was hard work in pre-industrial times because um, the oak timber is a hard material. So it was expensive and difficult to process. Another possible means of gaining access to timber was um, the reuse of wood. So they recovered it from building demolitions. And this wood also had um, considerable dimension stability because of the extra drying time it had. Indications of such reuse can be found in the form of uh, mortises and similar tool marks on beams um, that date from former usage periods. And even today there is a demand for historical org beams. Uh, this I found in the internet, historischebaustoffe.de, but there are also some at the um, uh, internet platform eBay. And this one um, they wanted to sell for about 2000 euros. Um, they say it's about 300 years old, um, excellent quality, and I'm sure someone will buy it one day. The reuse of building components is um, absolutely logical in the context of a circular economy and presents an obvious potential for long lasting hardwood components. So we should do it um, with modern construction as well. Ideally, it's later reuse should already be incorporated in the current design of a building component so that we already plan uh, how we will reuse it afterwards. Um, there are always already some internet sales platforms that deal with individual building components um, and materials whose origins can be traced. So the, that will be important in the future, I think. <clears throat> so now let's talk about beach. From a historical perspective, beach was not used as a structural building material. Um, it was too difficult to process. It's also a very heavy wood. Uh, and 
it has a tens tendency to split and warp. It's uneven, it's distorted during drying. Um, so the common areas of application included, for example, stairs, stringers, handrails, furniture, uh, and beach can be readily bent when exposed to steam. And the picture shows this famous um, chair number 14 from Tonet. Uh, from 1859. It's also known as the Viennese Bistro chair and sold uh, by the millions up to the present day. Um, a beach is very special. The sensitivity of beach to moisture and wood destroying organisms, however, it did not even allow it to use its plank flooring if it was going to be scrubbed with water. Um, and much less for any outdoor applications. Um, but this characteristic, um, it was um, good for quarry work. So in Carrara, for example, um, with the marble, the Romans were already exploiting this fact by driving wooden wedges into existing cracks in the stone. And then they poured water over these and the swelling wood developed such an explosive force that it could be used to detach stone blocks from the surrounding rock. So that happens when you pour water on beach. So beach wasn't used in construction um, and the large supply of beach trees was used mainly for energy since wood was the most important fuel until the emergence of industrial coal mining. Um, beach was of a particular importance due to its high heating value. It's a very hard uh, wood, so it, it also gives a lot of energy. And in the Middle Ages and in, in the early modern times, it's wood ash aided in the production of washing line glass, for which the existing beach stands were cut down on a huge scale. And I like this picture because until the 1950s, beach even powered cars in Germany. Um, numerous vehicles, among others passenger cars, pickup trucks, featured a wood gas carburetor. In these, wood was carbonized in the absence of oxygen, uh, which produced wood gas. And three kilogram of beach had about the same energy as one liter of petrol. Um, and even today, beach, like um, much like other types of hardwood is to a large extent still used directly to generate energy. So it's, it's just uh, burned and that's really a pity to burn such a wonderful wood or such a wonderful building material. Um, types of hardwood other than oak historically played a minor role in the construction sector. So depending on regional availability, there are some examples that were probably used specifically because of their particular characteristics or for the lack of more appropriate oak. So if they didn't have oak in the region, they used other trees. So there are excavations at Lake Constance, for example, um, where um, over 4,000 years ago, Pile dwellings were found on alder, a wood that is light but very resistant to submersion in water. Um, there's a um, replica um, in a museum here, the, that's just the picture on the right side. And on the left side, um, you see the famous um, church in Norway, this very old uh, timber construction from the 12th century, which is still preserved today. And it consists partly of the elm typical of the region. Uh, and there are also a quite op occasional reports of the use of ash. So they used whatever they could find and was suitable. Then we have the European chestnut. It is originated in southeastern Europe and Turkey and was brought north of the Alps by the Romans. So they used it uh, in viniculture. Um, but later also for the construction of residential houses and even in some churches. And even today, some examples of chestnut use in construction can be found uh, mainly in Spain, France, Italy. They use it in ceilings um, for roof beams or for terraces, but not in a large scale. So why is hardwood interesting for us now? 
Um, this image, image shows the increase in the heights of multi-story timber buildings over the centuries. Starting at the left side, you see that um, even here in Japan, year 18, um, 888, they were able to build very high in, uh, with timber construction. <clears throat> So since the advent of fortified cities and villages, developments and construction have focused on building high, multi-story buildings, sometimes due to a lack of space inside fortifications, but also for reasons of prestige, of course. Um, and in re regions where wood was the predominant building material, the knowledge and manual skills for building durable multi-story timber buildings have been established since antiquity. So they, they knew it and they could do it. But then here in the middle, in the classical modern area, era, um, steel, concrete, and glass were the most commonly used materials. And the timber construction faded into obscurity. So that was like, um, it had something like a backward reputation. Uh, timber was not a high performing material. And, it's, uh, and of course it was flammable. So once the primary building material, uh, timber was now used only for small buildings or temporary buildings. Um, and only now, in nowadays or in recent decades, has a revis uh, reversion to the use of timber in building construction been taking place. And of course, also in the context of climate change. Um, and now, um, we want to build high again, we want to build um, high timber constructions, and so we need high performing materials with potential for the future, and that could be uh, hardwood. So this outstanding properties of hardwood can lead to the optimization of existing timber materials or to completely new products. But now let's talk about the forest. Um, this is how Germany looked like in ancient, time, ancient times. Large part of Germany were forested in comparison to today's Germany seems almost bare. Um, this is a map which shows the wood coverage in Europe. And I have now a question for you. Um, I, I guess uh, we have students here from Denmark, Germany and the Netherlands. And I would like to ask you to tell me the percentage of forest area in your country. So just um, make a guess. I know it's hard to, to say, but um, just uh, tell me, let's, uh, let's start with Denmark. Does anyone know um, the percentage of forest area in Denmark? Who has an idea? Just uh, turn on your microphone and turn. Three percent. Three percent. Another guess, someone. Ten. Uh, ten. Nine. Now we have nine percent. Ten percent. Okay, it's twelve percent. Not so bad, but twelve percent. Um, a little bit more. Um, so Germany. Who knows how much forest is in Germany? Who has a guess? I can tell you it's a bit more. 15%? 15? 15, uh, 30. 30%. Uh, someone wrote 30. Okay, it's 31. That was close. Very good. Very good. And uh, in the Netherlands, what do you think? Someone has an idea about the Netherlands? I would guess around 10, 15, maybe. 10, 15, 10 in the chat. Let's have a look. 11. Very good. You're really good. <laughs> but you see, um, that's not much forest, unfortunately. And we had much, much more. Because in the past, wood was an elementary economic product. It was used for almost everything as fuel, metal production, furniture, house construction, um, electricity pylons in mines, as support pillars, railroad construction, uh, whatever. 
And since the Middle Ages, forests in Europe have been continuously cut down in order to obtain wood and to open up new settlement areas. This has led to the fact that around 1900 and even sometime before, hardly any forest remained in Europe. Um, and then the reforestation started. So that today we have 31% in Germany. And um, when they started the reforestation in those early days, softwood trees like spruce were often preferred as they usually grow faster than hardwood trees. They were profitable and due to their straight growth habits, they were better in many applications. For example, as load bearing beams and planks and construction. And today the spruce is the most common forestry in Germany. We have about 28% in our forests. Um, but as I already said, um, it is not natural, it is man-made. And the new forests were organized in rows, densely planted for fast yield. Um, so the undergrowth was quickly removed, tidy and effective. And spruces are well suited for this purpose as they're quite undemanding, fast growing. Um, yeah, so that was easy. But then um, we noticed that such monocultures are also quite susceptible to pests, especially if the trees are not to grow in their natural environment. And this happened after the hurricane called Lothar uh, was in Germany. So of course, spruces do indeed often grow in large monocultures, but in much cooler climates, for example, in Siberia or the Scandinavian countries. Um, so they like the cold, um, and their growth habit makes them not susceptible to, to snow brackage. But in warmer climates, on the other hand, um, it gets difficult for them. It gets too dry and too hot. And those little insects, uh, if there are not many freezing months in a year, they don't die. Um, spruces don't like air pollution and storms. Um, and natural, naturally, in Germany, for example, the um, spruce would grow in higher mountains. So this certainly reflects the distribution, distribution sorry, in Germany. In Bavaria, in the south, where I live, for example, about 50% are spruces, while in Brandenburg in the north, they only have 5%. And for this reasons, um, because of the climate change, it gets warmer, warmer, beginning in the early 1980s, um, we tried to mix the forests. So, uh, we tried to, to have beech and other hardwood um, species um, just to make the forests more robust. And I want to show you in this chart uh, just how everything is linked together and give you an overview about everything. So starting with the weather. This is um, the development of the weather in Germany over the last 12 years. So it gets warmer, we have more uh, hot uh, summer, that means um, that there are over 30 degrees and more storms. The average temperature is uh, rising. And um, that's why we have to change the wood species in our, uh, our forests. And as you can see here in the year 2012, we had um, 45% hardwood and 55% softwood, and they are now changing it um, to end up um, almost with the opposite in 2052. So we have uh, much more oak and beech and less um, spruce and pine. So and because of this hardwood in our forests, um, there's a new development of new hardwood products. We have many glue lamp products, beech, uh, oak, chestnut, and um, the beech LVL, which I will uh, talk about later because this is um, the most important invention because finally they have invented a way of processing the beech so it could, use in, could be used in construction. And in the end, uh, all those products are um, or help
I cannot hear you anymore. Mm, uh, Amen. We cannot hear you, but we're waiting. Probably it has to buffer. Okay, I didn't change anything. Now we hear you. Now we hear you. Thank you. That's better. Yes. Okay. Thank but you. you have to go back. How much back? How many? And and one. Yes, that we got. That was the last one we got. Okay, then we you didn't miss very much. That's just uh, that there are many projects now with hardwood um, products, and um, to use it to use hardwood in construction, it is important to know the characteristics. Uh, so, what is the difference? Hardwood versus softwood. On the left side, if you look at it under the microscope, you will notice the fundamentally different structure. So softwood is much older and it's very simple, uh, the structure. The water transport and stability are, are achieved with the same cell structure. Um, on the contrast, hardwood has developed its, its own tube system for water transport on the left side. Um, and because of this, hardwood is very hard, of course, and the, the most important property is its strength. Um, so this leads to slimmer cross sections uh, and we can save material and even replace concrete and steel. And what you see on the picture is um, the famous club in Berlin, the Berghain, and they have bought furniture made out of beach LVL because it's almost undestroyable. But on the other hand, um, hardwood is difficult to process and it requires new tools um, and new types of machines. So that's a hardwood screw, for example, and they have really uh, little diamonds on the top. I mean, this um, industrial diamonds, but only they can be hard enough to, um, um, well, to, to be put in the hardwood without pre-drilling. The greater strength of hardwood products re results in leaner cross sections. So if you look at this, um, on the top you have uh, the spruce glue lump and on the bottom the beach LVL and it's amazing how, how thin the construction can be uh, beach versus spruce. Um, and thus uh, this helps to save material. It, just looks better and you can really have um, very good constructions done with that. So this is, for example, a girder truss. Uh, on the left side, you have the softwood, spruce, glue lum. on the right beach, and you can see how slim it gets. And this is um, just offers great possibilities for designers. And also columns. Columns made of hardwood, especially under large loads and at normal story heights, are very high performing. So we um, compared it even with reinforced concrete columns. And even here, the beach LVL um, can have much less material here, 82% versus 100% uh, the concrete column. So it's therefore not surprising that hardwood pillars are implemented in many multi-story timber buildings. Um, they're often com combined with softwood pillars. So like in the old buildings, you can combine all these different types of, of wood. Um, what is a bit difficult is the harvest and processing, because you see it here, we have the spruce, uh, and the beach and the spruce is uh, just much easier to process. Um, so the hardwood trees usually have a larger branch structure and uh, that means the usable trunk would share varies from 40 to 50%. 
and if we have the software tree, the yield is much higher. So we get out 80%. And the building on the left side here, we see a poplar and uh, it's so heavy, even if when it falls, it gets cracks and can't be used anymore. But on the other hand, the surface quality is very high and it features a special aesthetic. This is a, a picture also from a club uh, in Munich, the Blitz Club, and they have a fantastic um, surface made of a beach and it creates a fantastic acoustic and just looks wonderful. So the durability depends very much on the wood species. Uh, wood is a natural material, of course, and if existing regulations are not observed, it is subject to degradation processes by fungi and insects. Um, and especially here, um, you see the oak as we know it, it is very durable. Now here you have the durability classes, but um, and the chestnut, but the others, maple, birch, beech, eucalyptus, poplar, they cannot be used outside. And this is, for example, um, a picture I will show you later. Also, uh, the the beach is especially moisture sensitive, and this building got wet, and <laughs> this is not. Not nice. So you have to have a good uh, protection on the construction side. This is always important when you build with uh, timber, but when you build with hardwood or beach, it is especially important. And this image shows a building site where the girder cross is wrapped in protective foil, for example. So the reasons for using hardwood again, um, it is available. You get slimmer cross sections due to this greater strength. Um, you have material and therefore cost savings. It looks just wonderful. It has a great surface. It is robust um, and durable depending on the wood species. This is an overview on the usability and availability of hardwood construction product, products. And um, it looks like a big list, but in fact, there are not so many products either um, regulated or available. And the most interesting one is um, uh, Baubuche, the beach uh, LVL, um, because uh, as what I said before, they have finally found a way how to manufacture beach. And I will explain you how and show you a little movie about that. So what they do, um, they treat the logs for 48 hours in water, they cook it. They, they really cook the trees in, in hot water. Um, to prepare the wood for the peeling process. And after that, the veneers, which are around three millimeters thick, are then rotary peeled from the cooked beech logs. Um, and so that's the best way to get an angular material from this cylindrical uh, log. Then they dry it. Uh, they bring it to a um, wood moisture content of 4% within 50 minutes. And after that, the glue is applied. Um, then the first panel runs through a microwave and then into the press. That's uh, the big one. And the heated area has a total length of 60 meters. So they can uh, theoretically produce really um, long beams. Um, it is bonded. Uh, and here, this is um, the starting material for all the products. And they, then they cut it in the length um, or into the lamellas you require. But this is really the way it, it seems uh, a bit complicated, but they really found a way how to deal with this very complicated material. Now I will show you the same, which I described in a short video. <laughs>
Okay, um, now at last I show you some real life examples where hardwood was used in construction and many of the projects are uh, realized with Baubuche with Beach LVL. Um, so this project you probably know, it's very famous, it's from Shigeru Ban in Zurich. And um, the hardwood was only used in as a very small piece as a connecting agent. Um, so it plays a small but very important role. And you know, Shigeru Ban, he's a uh, Japanese architect who's known for combining traditional Japanese construction methods with modern architecture. And this was his first building in Switzerland for the Tamedia group. It was carried out with uh, Hermann Blume, you already know. Um, and it's a five-story office building, uh, and they wanted to show this special wooden construction, though it has only a glass facade and makes the building very special. This is the supporting structure. Uh, it doesn't require any glue or additional steel reinforcement, and you can see the continuous support supplied in one piece, that uh, 21 meters long. And in total, I think about 2,000 cubic meters of spruce wood were used. And this is where the hardwood comes into play. It is used as connecting agent because of its strength, of course, here in the middle, and you won't see it afterwards. Um, and this only works with prefabricated elements, and they have to be absolutely dry because imagine this node element would get wet and swell and it wouldn't fit anymore so it's all um, prefabricated and exactly cut in this project hardwood was used in parts of the structural system so a bit more it's a administrative building in switzerland also it's 36 meters high um, I think it was at that time the biggest timber building in Switzerland with 10 stories. And it has a hybrid timber concrete construction. Um, so you have um, two reinforced concrete access cores and a timber skeleton construction. With uh, pillars, they are arranged, uh, arranged at intervals of 11 meters and 575 in the facade areas. Um, 
And the interesting part is the use of softwood and hardwood according to the load. That means the heavily stressed columns and girders in the interior are made of extremely load-bearing beach LVL, what we've seen before, the Baumuche. Um, so as to facilitate econom uh, economical dimensions. And the columns in the facade and the remaining timber surfaces are of spruce or spruce uh, gluelam. So that's just cheaper. And on the isometric drawing, you can see in gray the concrete structure. Um, then the timber structure with components of spruce light and the beach LVL dark. So that's, this is here close uh, to the concrete structure and some parts on the facade. What they uh, did, they invented a new prefabricated wood concrete composite ceiling with um, beach LVL and concrete which wasn't easy because the concrete is a bit wet and to combine it with the beach was not easy as the engineer told me. And you can see the holes for the installations. Uh, so all installations for heating and cooling run in these panels, which are of course prefabricated. And this is a very nice view from the inside with the beach construction and the uh, spruce cladding on the back. Um, this is uh, a hybrid construction in also in Switzerland. We have many Swiss projects here. Um, also because using hardwood is still quite expensive. And as you know, in Switzerland, you, they can just afford a bit more expensive projects. So here in Inner Arosa, um, that's a beautiful ski resort and it has lots of snow. And they needed a new ski school and a parking. And so they combined both. There's two very different building types in one building. So the um, parking uh, with two stories and 300 places, spaces underground. And on this concrete plateau, the ski school is located. It's uh, divided into two buildings um, and opens towards the mountains. And it's really beautiful. And um, this white roof construction is visible from afar and spans um, the closed and open areas. And they needed a really good construction because um, it spans, I don't know how many meters, but it's um, because of this very large spans and the extreme snow loads, hardwood was the best choice for use, but in certain areas. And this is, um, so interesting because they use nowadays the hardwood like they used it uh, in the past. They just um, put it in those places where it's really needed because it's um, it's not easy to work with it and it's more expensive. And um, the wood species they use here is ash. Ash is um, quite a common tree in Switzerland and they had a combination of um, ash glue and beans and spruce. And so they, they made it possible to have quite, um, quite a slender construction and um, to work with these long spans. Um, and they had to pour the concrete for the column heads very precisely in order to ensure that the timber beans could be custom fitted onto these several columns. Um, and in heavily stressed areas, as you can see here, the beams are made of ash, um, which is, as we know, much more loadable. So that's a wonderful picture where you can see the combined beams, um, the ash reinforcement of the spruce glue and beams and in the back of the mountains. Wonderful. So that's the last project. Um, that's a colleague of mine who built it, and that was one of the very first buildings um, which was realized in Baubuche. Um, it's a three-story office building in Augsburg and my colleague really wanted to realize it completely in beach. That's why it's called Alles Buche. So the bearing structure is a classic timber frame construction, but in beach LVL. Um, and that was making extremely slim cross sections possible. Uh, so the client wanted to have an ecological and flexible architecture 
uh, as you can see, is um, uh, quite regular construction. Uh, he wanted to have a wooden building. But as I said, the special, special thing is that it's almost completely made of beach. And as it was not known at that time, this material, it was not easy to convince the client. That's a um, picture from the inside. And what Frank did, he just calculated everything. Uh, and you can see here um, the beach and the strews. And of course, um, beach is more expensive but as uh, he used less material, in the end, it's almost the same price. And so he con could convince uh, the client. And now he's very proud of the building. Um, then he invented a very special connection of a dovetail and it was um, tested, but then not realized due to the lack of approval. Um, and for this connection in spruce, blue lum, a fire rating approval exists, but not for beach. And it would have taken too long to wait for the certificate. So they did it this way. Um, that's also okay, but they needed to um, attach it with two screws, which you usually don't need, but they just didn't accept it. And so it took much longer to construct it. Yet the ceiling beams are mounted. It looks wonderful, just like furniture um, with the holes for the cables. And then the ceiling tile comes also made of beach. And here on the top, you can see the uh, screw holes. And then it started to rain and everyone who builds with wood is afraid of this. And what was quite clear, beach and water, what we already have discussed is like yeast cake. And for this reason, as, as far as possible, all parts were prefabricated and protected at the plant. But of course, this was not possible with the ceiling that had to be assembled and waterproofed on site in a single operation. And unfortunately, while they were erecting the timber building in June, there was a summer storm. And the waterproofing worked well, except for one connection between two stacked columns that penetrate the ceiling slab. And at one spot, the hole cut into the beach panel was not cleanly masked and that caused uh, water damage. And it looked like this. One of the columns swelled slightly and the ceiling slab was discolored and the spots were clearly visible. And that's of course not what the client wants. So that's uh, the image you have seen before. Um, so grinding was not possible, but they tried to treat it with, or to bleach it with oxalic acid, and that worked quite well. It's uh, still visible, but hardly visible. And this proved that prefabrication and careful organization building protection during the construction phase, that's just essential. And this applies to timber construction in general, but in for beach in particular. Um, so hardwood is a high performance material with potential for the future, um, but definitely new developments and improvements in structural hardwood products are, need, are needed. So I'm sure that um, hardwood is an important material. It, would, it will not be able to replace softwood completely in construction, but that's not the goal but it will expand the range of applications for wood components and, and maybe replace steel or concrete. And it's uh, important that new developments and improvements in structural hardwood products um, are needed. So it's important to bear in mind that the development of modern timber construction um, that covers a period of well over a hundred years. So hardwood just needs, needs a little more time but I'm certain that robust hardwoods will therefore play an important role in the future supply of timber con construction products. Um, so at the end, I want to say that um, these are the challenges for the future. We have to build faster for more people with fewer renewable resources on less land with lower emissions. <laughs> so it's really hard to reach that goal, but. I believe that both uh, build, building simply and using hardwood could help achieve that goal. Thank you very much. <laughs>